Hello, Anderson Smith again, and today we're going to talk about the primary biological influence on behavior, the nervous system. I probably should say nervous systems, because as we will see, there are more than one that have different functions in controlling behavior. First, we have the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord, but we also have a peripheral nervous system, which are all of those nerve cells outside of the brain and spinal cord. In fact, the peripheral nervous system can also be divided into the somatic system, which the nerves coming from the sense organs into the, into the central nervous system, and those going from the central nervous system out to the parts of the body. The, the cells coming into the central nervous system from the hands and limbs and other parts of the body are called afferent nerves, and the ones going, sending information out to the muscles from the brain and spinal cord are called efferent systems. The other of the peripheral nervous system is the autonomic system, which really serves the visceral structures. And believe it or not, the autonomic system can be divided into two different parts. The parasympathetic nervous system, which basically controls the visceral responses like heartbeat, breathing, things that are sort of involuntary but keeps us alive. And the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight response, um, which, which really affects also a visceral kind of response to things that, that frighten us. Now, we, we really don't have to go to the brain with the uh, somatic system. For example, there's, a re there's, some, there's some reflexes. For example, if I were to touch a hot stove, uh, my hand would immediately be jerked away. And what causes that is the afferent nerve, the one that's coming in from my finger that feels the pain and the heat, goes into the spinal cord. It connects with just one simple interneuron in the spinal cord, and then that information goes back to the muscles, telling them to jerk the hand away. It's called a reflex, and we have reflexes that involve the spinal cord, but don't even involve the brain. To talk about the brain, we have probably 100 billion different cells in the brain itself. And we can divide the brain into the hind brain, the oldest part of the brain, the one that all animals have, which consists of the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. And it controls basically the, the, the sort of life responses that we have. It, it, it controls breathing and heart rate. It, con it has a cerebellum, which controls movement and motion. Uh, it's, it's the old part of the brain. Any, any brain of any animal that you get, you will see these brain parts. In fact, in lower animals, they're much, much larger in, relatively to the other parts of the brain than in humans. The midbrain, it's the next level up in the brain, and it consists of uh, some lower auditory and visual centers in the reticular formation that's, that simply serves as a, as a way to get information from the lower part of the brain up into the, the higher parts of the brain. And the higher part of the brain is called the forebrain. And the forebrain consists of the thalamus, which is sort of a relay station for information coming in and going out. The hypothalamus, as we we'll see, controls uh, motivation. The limbic system, which controls memory formation, also emotion. And the cerebrum. And in the cerebrum, or the cerebral cortex, in humans is the largest part of the brain. As we've advanced, we've got, actually developed more and more cortical cells, which control much higher functions like thinking and the perception and attention and all the things which we do pretty well as human beings. Now, this, this chart shows the parts of the brain. If I did a slice right down the middle of it, it shows the cortical parts, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the, the occipital lobe, and we'll talk about those in a minute. They're the, co the, co the cortex or cerebrum. But it also has a, a section which connects the, the two halves of the brain together. There are two hemispheres in the brain, and the part that connects them together is the corpus callosum. And we'll, we'll talk more about the corpus callosum in a minute. There's the cerebellum in the hind brain that can, that's primarily movement and motion. There's the thalamus, which can, is the sort of relay station for getting information up to the cortical areas. And, and then you can see the hind brain, the pons, and the medulla. It doesn't show the hypothalamus, but it's right there between the, the thalamus and the pons and the spinal cord. Let's put the brain back together again, and we can see the, the, cortical, hemis the cortical hemispheres. There's the frontal lobe, which is very important for um, making decisions. There's the parietal lobe, which has the motor sections, and we'll show, show you that in a minute. The temporal lobe, which is primarily audition and memory. The occipital lobe in the back, which is uh, 
controls vision, and we've already talked about the cerebellum. So that, and you can see these, these lobes so really distinguish each other by these fissures, the lateral fissure between the, the temporal lobe and the central fissure uh, between the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe. Along the central fissure, right along on both sides, there's the motor area and the sensory area which receives touch sensations from the parts of the body. And actually, it's, it's lined up well, as you can see in this structure, sort of the cortical homunculus, uh, the, the feet, then the legs, then the hands, then the trunk, then the face, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the tongue. Um, and so this was discovered by, really a, quite a while ago in the 1950s, by a neurosurgeon called Wilbur Penfield. And he was doing surgery to cure people of epileptic seizures. And what they have to do is go in and isolate where the, where the epileptic seizure starts and try to separate that part of the brain from other parts of the brain so the seizure doesn't spread across the brain. Like a, like, it's like building a firewall to keep the fire from spreading. In doing that, he had to stimulate to make sure he wasn't going to destroy a part of the brain that was important. Why he didn't think all the brain was important, I don't know. But he actually stimulated and, and watched what the person does. And if he stimulated up here, the person would feel someone touching their, their leg or their arm or their fingers. And he could actually stimulate the part of the brain that controls speech on the left hemisphere, and he could get people to talk, ah, 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 to make sounds. He could touch the occipital lobe, and people saw things. It's like, this, like usually bright lights or something. Um, and he did this while the people were awake. They were on local anesthesia only. And then he would find where the best place to actually sever the part of the brain that would reduce the epileptic seizure. And it, it, as, as a cure to epilepsy, it was worked w really well. But we'll, we'll see a little bit later that sometimes the surgery of, if it had to do a lot of surgery, it really could greatly affect people. Like, for example, I mentioned earlier in one of the earlier lectures the idea of the bilateral temporal lobectomy, where they went in and cut the hippocampus on both sides. The person was cured of, ep of epileptic seizures, but he couldn't learn anything new. He lost his ability in the hippocampus to form new memories. And so his memory bank simply was filled when the day the surgery occurred and he could learn no more new information. So and then on the motor area right across the central, fi central fissure is the uh, sensory area that receives information. So if, if he stimulated the sensory area, they would feel things, see things. If he stimulated it, the um, motor area, they would actually move a part of the body. Now I want to talk now about the corpus callosum. Uh, Roger Sperry, the person on the, the picture that you see there, actually won the Nobel Prize for his work, primarily in animals with the role of the corpus callosum in interhemispheric transfer and communication. He would cut the corpus callosum in an animal and then look to see that, in fact, there they had like two brains rather than one because the, the left hemisphere could not communicate with the right hemisphere and vice versa. This was carried on by his colleague, Michael Gazaniga, at Dartmouth College. And Dr. Gazaniga did a lot of the work with humans, again, who had surgery for epileptic seizures where the corpus callosum was cut and observed the behavior. By, by the way, they, even though they did not, could not communicate between the left and the right hemisphere, they behaved fairly Okay, sometimes when the two hands had to work together on something, it wasn't quite as coordinated because the left hand and the right hand were independent of each other. So watching a person with a split brain tie shoes is sort of an interesting observation to watch. Now, what you have to know about, to look at some of the experiments that Gazaniga did in his laboratory, is you have to understand that the two hemispheres are not symmetrical. They do different things. For example, Everything in my left visual field, I see in my right hemisphere. In my right visual field, I see in my left hemisphere. And this chart sort of shows that. The information comes in from the eye. Things on the left go to the right part of the retina. And things on the, on the right side go to the left part of the retina. And then they put information. There's actually a crossover in the eyes for half of the optic nerve called the optic chasm where information from the right visual field crosses over and goes to the, to the left, over to the left uh, 
occipital lobe, and information in the left visual field goes to the right occipital lobe. So if you flash something on a screen in front of a split brain patient, you can determine whether or not it goes to the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere by which side of the visual field it's on. I'm sorry about my really crummy drawing, but uh, I think you get the point, hopefully. Here's what they do in the experiments. Remember, these patients have uh, a, a, a corpus callosum is completely severed, so by flashing the word key onto the onto the screen, it goes only to the right hemisphere. And the right hemisphere controls the left hand. So if I flash the word key and the left hand behind the screen, it could actually pick up the key, even though it can't say it. Why can't it say it? Because language is located in the left hemisphere. So it, you can say, what, what was the flashed up there? The left hemisphere doesn't know. T to speak it, but it can pick it up with the left hand because it's in the right hemisphere. If I flash it something to the right hemisphere, and I ask the person to, so it's in the right hemisphere, excuse me, it, it, the word pen is in the right visual field, so it's in the left hemisphere, and I ask the person to pick it up with the left hand, they can't do it because the right hemisphere controls the left hand. But every patient eventually is able to do it. And how do they do it? They say the word pen. And then, of course, you said the word pen because you have the speech center in the left hemisphere. Um, it goes out. It goes in the ears. Now the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere both know what you're looking for, and the left hand now can pick it up. So you have to say the word pen so you can hear it, goes to both hemispheres, and now the left hand is able to control it. If I have the word pen up there and I ask the person simply to pick it up with the left hand, it, it can't do it until it hears the word pen, because now it's actually in the right hemisphere that's controlling the left hand. So split brain research has taught us a lot about how the brain works and uh, how the corpus callosum allows integration of information from the left and the right hemispheres. There are a lot of asymmetries in the brain. Um, that is where things are located on one side and not the other side. Mathematics, for example, is better in the, le is in the left hemisphere. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing about the brain that we have this sort of lots of duplication, but at the same time, lots of, lots of specialization in the brain itself. So today we've looked at the nervous system. We looked at the peripheral nervous system, the brain, the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. We talked about the peripheral nervous system consisting of somatic and consisting of autonomic uh, systems. And we see how the brain, with its huge complexity, 100 trillion connections of neurons, some people estimate, uh, is a very powerful organ to control and help us understand behavior as it occurs. Thank you.